Well hello there, dear listeners. Welcome back on a journey around the world in 80 days. In the previous episode our adventurers arrived in California. Right away they got themselves into a bit of a scuffle with the locals at a political rally. Some harsh words were exchanged and Mr. Fix got smacked squarely in the head, but they managed to escape without further harm. Our heroes then boarded the transcontinental railway and are now zooming across the continental U.S. somewhere in the country inhabited by the Mormons. So then, without further ado, let's get on with the story. Chapter 27 In which Passepartout undergoes, at a speed of 20 miles an hour, a course of Mormon history. During the night of the 5th of December, the train ran southeasterly for about 50 miles, then rose an equal distance in a northeasterly direction, towards the Great Salt Lake. Passepartout, about nine o'clock, went out upon the platform to take the air. The weather was cold, the heavens gray, but it was not snowing. The sun's disk, enlarged by the mist, seemed an enormous ring of gold, and Passepartout was amusing himself by calculating its value in pounds sterling, when he was diverted from this interesting study by a strange-looking personage who made his appearance on the platform. This personage, who had taken the train at Elko, was tall and dark, with black mustache, black stockings, a black silk hat, a black waistcoat, black trousers, a white cravat, and dogskin gloves. He might have been taken for a clergyman. He went from one end of the train to the other, and affixed to the door of each car a notice written in manuscript. Passepartout approached and read one of these notices, which stated that Elder William Hitch, Mormon missionary, taking advantage of his presence on train number 48, would deliver a lecture on Mormonism in car number 117, from 11 to 12 o'clock, and that he invited all who were desirous of being instructed concerning the mysteries of the religion of the Latter-day Saints to attend. I'll go, said Passepartout to himself. He knew nothing of Mormonism except the custom of polygamy, which is its foundation. The news quickly spread through the train which contained about 100 passengers, 30 of whom, at most, attracted by the notice, ensconced themselves in car number 117. Passepartout took one of the front seats. Neither Mr. Fogg nor Fix cared to attend. At the appointed hour Elder William Hitch rose, and, in an irritated voice, as if he had already been contradicted, said. I tell you that Joe Smith is a martyr, that his brother Hiram is a martyr, and that the persecutions of the United States government against the prophets will also make a martyr of Brigham Young. Who dares to say the contrary? No one ventured to gainsay the missionary, whose excited tone contrasted curiously with his naturally calm visage. No doubt his anger arose from the hardships to which the Mormons were actually subjected. The government had just succeeded, with some difficulty, in reducing these independent fanatics to its rule. It had made itself master of Utah, and subjected that territory to the laws of the Union, after imprisoning Brigham Young on a charge of rebellion and polygamy. The disciples of the Prophet had since redoubled their efforts, and resisted, by words at least, the authority of Congress. Elder Hitch, as is seen, was trying to make proselytes on the very railway trains. Then, emphasizing his words with his loud voice and frequent gestures, he related the history of the Mormons from biblical times. How that, in Israel, a Mormon prophet of the tribe of Joseph published the annals of the new religion, and bequeathed them to his son Mormon. How, many centuries later, a translation of this precious book, which was written in Egyptian, was made by Joseph Smith, Jr., a Vermont farmer, who revealed himself as a mystical prophet in 1825. And how, in short, the celestial messenger appeared to him in an illuminated forest, and gave him the annals of the Lord. Several of the audience, not being much interested in the missionary's narrative, here left the car. But Elder Hitch, continuing his lecture, related how Smith, Jr., with his father, two brothers, and a few disciples, founded the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which, adopted not only in America, but in England, Norway and Sweden, and Germany, counts many artisans, as well as men engaged in the liberal professions, among its members. How a colony was established in Ohio a temple erected there at a cost of $200,000, and a town built at Kirkland. How Smith became an enterprising banker, and received from a simple mummy showman a papyrus scroll written by Abraham and several famous Egyptians. The elder's story became somewhat wearisome, and his audience grew gradually less, until it was reduced to 20 passengers. But this did not disconcert the enthusiast, who proceeded with the story of Joseph Smith's bankruptcy in 1837, 
and how his ruined creditors gave him a coat of tar and feathers. His reappearance some years afterwards, more honorable and honored than ever, at Independence, Missouri, the chief of a flourishing colony of 3,000 disciples, and his pursuit thence by outraged Gentiles, and retirement into the far west. Ten hearers only were now left, among them honest Passepartout, who was listening with all his ears. Thus he learned that, after long persecutions, Smith reappeared in Illinois, and in 1839 founded a community at Novu, on the Mississippi, numbering 25,000 souls, of which he became mayor, chief justice, and general-in-chief. That he announced himself, in 1843, as a candidate for the presidency of the United States, and that finally, being drawn into ambuscade at Carthage, he was thrown into prison, and assassinated by a band of men disguised in masks. Passepartout was now the only person left in the car, and the elder, looking him full in the face, reminded him that, two years after the assassination of Joseph Smith, the inspired prophet, Brigham Young, his successor, left Novu for the banks of the Great Salt Lake, where, in the midst of that fertile region, directly on the route of the emigrants who crossed Utah on their way to California, the new colony, thanks to the polygamy practiced by the Mormons, had flourished beyond expectations. And this, added Elder William Hitch, this is why the jealousy of Congress has been aroused against us. Why have the soldiers of the Union invaded the soil of Utah? Why has Brigham Young, our chief, been imprisoned, in contempt of all justice? Shall we yield to force? Never. Driven from Vermont, driven from Illinois, driven from Ohio, driven from Missouri, driven from Utah, we shall yet find some independent territory on which to plant our tents. And you, my brother, continued the elder, fixing his angry eyes upon his single auditor. Will you not plant yours there, too, under the shadow of our flag? No, replied Passepartout courageously, in his turn retiring from the car, and leaving the elder to preach to vacancy. During the lecture the train had been making good progress, and towards half-past twelve it reached the northwest border of the Great Salt Lake. Thence the passengers could observe the vast extent of this interior sea, which is also called the Dead Sea, and into which flows an American Jordan. It is a picturesque expanse, framed in lofty crags in large strata, encrusted with white salt, a superb sheet of water, which was formerly of larger extent than now, its shores having encroached with the lapse of time, and thus at once reduced its breadth and increased its depth. The Salt Lake, 70 miles long and 35 wide, is situated 3 miles 800 feet above the sea. Quite different from Lake Asphaltite, whose depression is 1200 feet below the sea, it contains considerable salt, and one quarter of the weight of its water is solid matter, its specific weight being 1170, and, after being distilled, 1000. Fishes are, of course, unable to live in it, and those which descend through the Jordan, the Weber, and other streams soon perish. The country around the lake was well cultivated, for the Mormons are mostly farmers, while ranches and pens for domesticated animals, fields of wheat, corn, and other cereals, luxuriant prairies, hedges of wild rose, clumps of acacias and milkwort, would have been seen six months later. Now the ground was covered with a thin powdering of snow. The train reached Ogden at two o'clock, where it rested for six hours, Mr. Fogg and his party had time to pay a visit to Salt Lake City, connected with Ogden by a branch road, and they spent two hours in this strikingly American town, built on the pattern of other cities of the Union, like a checkerboard, with the somber sadness of right angles, as Victor Hugo expresses it. The founder of the City of the Saints could not escape from the taste for symmetry which distinguishes the Anglo-Saxons. In this strange country, where the people are certainly not up to the level of their institutions, everything is done squarely, cities, houses, and follies. The travelers, then, were promenading, at three o'clock, about the streets of the town built between the banks of the Jordan and the spurs of the Wasatch Range. They saw few or no churches, but the prophet's mansion, the courthouse, and the arsenal, blue brick houses with verandas and porches, surrounded by gardens bordered with acacias, palms, and locusts. A clay and pebble wall, built in 1853, surrounded the town, and in the principal street were the market and several hotels adorned with pavilions. The place did not seem thickly populated. The streets were almost deserted, except in the vicinity of the temple, which they only reached after having traversed several quarters surrounded by palisades. There were many women, which was easily accounted for by the peculiar institution of the Mormons, but it must not be supposed that all the Mormons are polygamists. They are free to marry or not, as they please, 
but it is worth noting that it is mainly the female citizens of Utah who are anxious to marry, as, according to the Mormon religion, maiden ladies are not admitted to the possession of its highest joys. These poor creatures seem to be neither well off nor happy. Some, the more well to do, no doubt, wore short, open, black silk dresses, under a hood or modest shawl. Others were habited in Indian fashion. Passepartout could not behold without a certain fright these women, charged, in groups, with conferring happiness on a single Mormon. His common sense pitied, above all, the husband. It seemed to him a terrible thing to have to guide so many wives at once across the vicissitudes of life, and to conduct them, as it were, in a body to the Mormon paradise with the prospect of seeing them in the company of the glorious smith, who doubtless was the chief ornament of that delightful place, to all eternity. He felt decidedly repelled from such a vocation, and he imagined, perhaps he was mistaken, that the fair ones of Salt Lake City cast rather alarming glances on his person. Happily, his stay there was but brief. At four the party found themselves again at the station, took their places in the train, and the whistle sounded for starting. Just at the moment, however, that the locomotive wheels began to move, cries of Stop! Stop! were heard. Trains, like time and tide, stopped for no one. The gentleman who uttered the cries was evidently a belated Mormon. He was breathless with running. Happily for him, the station had neither gates nor barriers. He rushed along the track, jumped on the rear platform of the train, and fell, exhausted, into one of the seats. Passepartout, who had been anxiously watching this amateur gymnast, approached him with lively interest, and learned that he had taken flight after an unpleasant domestic scene. When the Mormon had recovered his breath, Passepartout ventured to ask him politely how many wives he had, for, from the manner in which he had decamped, it might be thought that he had twenty at least. One, sir, replied the Mormon, raising his arms heavenward. One, and that was enough. Chapter 28 In which Passepartout does not succeed in making anybody listen to reason. The train, on leaving Great Salt Lake at Ogden, passed northward for an hour as far as Weber River, having completed nearly 900 miles from San Francisco. From this point it took an easterly direction towards the jagged Wasatch Mountains. It was in the section included between this range and the Rocky Mountains that the American engineers found the most formidable difficulties in laying the road, and that the government granted a subsidy of $48,000 per mile, instead of $16,000 allowed for the work done on the plains. But the engineers, instead of violating nature, avoided its difficulties by winding around, instead of penetrating the rocks. One tunnel only, 14,000 feet in length, was pierced in order to arrive at the Great Basin. The track up to this time had reached its highest elevation at the Great Salt Lake. From this point it described a long curve, descending towards Bitter Creek Valley, to rise again to the dividing ridge of the waters between the Atlantic and the Pacific. There were many creeks in this mountainous region, and it was necessary to cross Muddy Creek, Green Creek, and others, upon culverts. Passepartout grew more and more impatient as they went on, while Fix longed to get out of this difficult region, and was more anxious than Phileas Fogg himself to be beyond the danger of delays and accidents, and set foot on English soil. At ten o'clock at night the train stopped at Fort Bridger Station, and twenty minutes later entered Wyoming Territory, following the valley of Bitter Creek throughout. The next day, the 7th of December, they stopped for a quarter of an hour at Green River Station. Snow had fallen abundantly during the night, but, being mixed with rain, it had half melted, and did not interrupt their progress. The bad weather, however, annoyed Passepartout, for the accumulation of snow, by blocking the wheels of the cars, would certainly have been fatal to Mr. Fogg's tour. What an idea! He said to himself. Why did my master make this journey in winter? Couldn't he have waited for the good season to increase his chances? While the worthy Frenchman was absorbed in the state of the sky and the depression of the temperature, Audaw was experiencing fears from a totally different cause. Several passengers had got off at Green River, and were walking up and down the platforms, and among these Audaw recognized Colonel Stamp Proctor, the same who had so grossly insulted Phileas Fogg at the San Francisco meeting. Not wishing to be recognized, the young woman drew back from the window, feeling much alarm at her discovery. She was attached to the man who, however coldly, gave her daily evidences of the most absolute devotion. She did not comprehend, perhaps, the depth of the sentiment with which her protector inspired her, which she called gratitude, 
but which, though she was unconscious of it, was really more than that. Her heart sank within her when she recognized the man whom Mr. Fogg desired, sooner or later, to call to account for his conduct. Chance alone, it was clear, had brought Colonel Proctor on this train, but there he was, and it was necessary, at all hazards, that Phileas Fogg should not perceive his adversary. Auda seized a moment when Mr. Fogg was asleep to tell Fix and Passepartout whom she had seen. That Proctor on this train! cried Fix. Well, reassure yourself, madam, before he settles with Mr. Fogg, he has got to deal with me. It seems to me that I was the more insulted of the two. And, besides, added Passepartout, I'll take charge of him, colonel as he is. Mr. Fix, resumed Auda. Mr. Fogg will allow no one to avenge him. He said that he would come back to America to find this man. Should he perceive Colonel Proctor, we could not prevent a collision which might have terrible results. He must not see him. You are right, madam, replied Fix. A meeting between them might ruin all. Whether he were victorious or beaten, Mr. Fogg would be delayed, and... And... Added Passepartout. That would play the game of the gentlemen of the Reform Club. In four days we shall be in New York. Well, if my master does not leave this car during those four days, we may hope that chance will not bring him face to face with this confounded American. We must, if possible, prevent his stirring out of it. The conversation dropped. Mr. Fogg had just woke up, and was looking out of the window. Soon after Passepartout, without being heard by his master or Auda, whispered to the detective. Would you really fight for him? I would do anything replied Fix, in a tone which betrayed determined will. To get him back living to Europe. Passepartout felt something like a shudder shoot through his frame, but his confidence in his master remained unbroken. Was there any means of detaining Mr. Fogg in the car, to avoid a meeting between him and the colonel? It ought not to be a difficult task, since that gentleman was naturally sedentary and little curious. The detective, at least, seemed to have found a way, for, after a few moments, he said to Mr. Fogg. These are long and slow hours, sir, that we are passing on the railway. Yes, replied Mr. Fogg. But they pass. You were in the habit of playing whist. Resumed Fix. On the steamers. Yes, but it would be difficult to do so here. I have neither cards nor partners. Oh, but we can easily buy some cards, for they are sold on all the American trains. And as for partners, if madam plays. Certainly, sir. Auda quickly replied. I understand whist. It is part of an English education. I myself have some pretensions to playing a good game. Well, here are three of us, and a dummy. As you please, sir. Replied Phileas Fogg, heartily glad to resume his favorite pastime even on the railway. Passepartout was dispatched in search of the steward and soon returned with two packs of cards, some pins, counters, and a shelf covered with cloth. The game commenced. Auda understood whist sufficiently well, and even received some compliments on her playing from Mr. Fogg. As for the detective, he was simply an adept, and worthy of being matched against his present opponent. Now, thought Passepartout, we've got him, he won't budge. At eleven in the morning the train had reached the dividing ridge of the waters at Bridger Pass, 7,524 feet above the level of the sea, one of the highest points attained by the track in crossing the Rocky Mountains. After going about 200 miles, the travelers at last found themselves on one of those vast plains which extend to the Atlantic, and which nature has made so propitious for laying the iron road. On the declivity of the Atlantic Basin the first streams, branches of the North Platte River, already appeared. The whole northern and eastern horizon was bounded by the immense semicircular curtain which is formed by the southern portion of the Rocky Mountains, the highest being Laramie Peak. Between this and the railway extended vast plains, plentifully irrigated. On the right rose the lower spurs of the mountainous mass which extends southward to the sources of the Arkansas River, one of the great tributaries of the Missouri. At half past twelve the travelers caught sight for an instant of Fort Halleck, which commands that section and in a few more hours the Rocky Mountains were crossed. There was reason to hope, then, that no accident would mark the journey through this difficult country. The snow had ceased falling, and the air became crisp and cold. Large birds, frightened by the locomotive, rose and flew off in the distance. 
No wild beast appeared on the plain. It was a desert in its vast nakedness. After a comfortable breakfast, served in the car, Mr. Fogg and his partners had just resumed whist, when a violent whistling was heard, and the train stopped. Passepartout put his head out of the door, but saw nothing to cause the delay. No station was in view. Auda and Fix feared that Mr. Fogg might take it into his head to get out, but that gentleman contented himself with saying to his servant, See what is the matter. Passepartout rushed out of the car. Thirty or forty passengers had already descended, amongst them Colonel Stamp Proctor. The train had stopped before a red signal which blocked the way. The engineer and conductor were talking excitedly with a signalman, whom the station master at Medicine Bow, the next stopping place, had sent on before. The passengers drew around and took part in the discussion, in which Colonel Proctor, with his insolent manner, was conspicuous. Passepartout, joining the group, heard the signalman say, No, you can't pass. The bridge at Medicine Bow is shaky, and would not bear the weight of the train. This was a suspension bridge thrown over some rapids, about a mile from the place where they now were. According to the signalman, it was in a ruinous condition, several of the iron wires being broken, and it was impossible to risk the passage. He did not in any way exaggerate the condition of the bridge. It may be taken for granted that, rash as the Americans usually are, when they are prudent there is good reason for it. Passepartout, not daring to apprise his master of what he heard, listened with set teeth, immovable as a statue. Hum! cried Colonel Proctor. But we are not going to stay here, I imagine, and take root in the snow. Colonel! replied the conductor. We have telegraphed to Omaha for a train but it is not likely that it will reach Medicine Bow in less than six hours. Six hours! cried Passepartout. Certainly! returned the conductor. Besides, it will take us as long as that to reach Medicine Bow on foot. But it is only a mile from here! said one of the passengers. Yes, but it's on the other side of the river. And can't we cross that in a boat? asked the colonel. That's impossible. The creek is swelled by the rains. It is a rapid, and we shall have to make a circuit of ten miles to the north to find a ford. The colonel launched a volley of oaths, denouncing the railway company and the conductor, and Passepartout, who was furious, was not disinclined to make common cause with him. Here was an obstacle, indeed, which all his master's banknotes could not remove. There was a general disappointment among the passengers, who, without reckoning the delay, saw themselves compelled to trudge fifteen miles over a plain covered with snow. They grumbled and protested, and would certainly have thus attracted Phileas Fogg's attention if he had not been completely absorbed in his game. Passepartout found that he could not avoid telling his master what had occurred, and, with hanging head, he was turning towards the car, when the engineer, a true Yankee, named Forster called out. Gentlemen, perhaps there is a way, after all, to get over. On the bridge? asked a passenger. On the bridge. With our train? With our train. Passepartout stopped short, and eagerly listened to the engineer. But the bridge is unsafe. Urged the conductor. No matter. Replied Forster. I think that by putting on the very highest speed we might have a chance of getting over. The devil. Muttered Passepartout. But a number of the passengers were at once attracted by the engineer's proposal, and Colonel Proctor was especially delighted, and found the plan a very feasible one. He told stories about engineers leaping their trains over rivers without bridges, by putting on full steam, and many of those present avowed themselves of the engineer's mind. We have fifty chances out of a hundred of getting over, said one. Eighty, ninety. Passepartout was astounded and, though ready to attempt anything to get over Medicine Creek, thought the experiment proposed a little too American. Besides, thought he, there's a still more simple way, and it does not even occur to any of these people. Sir, said he aloud to one of the passengers. The engineer's plan seems to me a little dangerous, but... Eighty chances, replied the passenger, turning his back on him. I know it, said Passepartout, turning to another passenger. But a simple idea. Ideas are no use. Returned the American, shrugging his shoulders. As the engineer shows us that we can pass. 
Doubtless. Urged Passepartout. We can pass, but perhaps it would be more prudent. What? Prudent? Cried Colonel Proctor, whom this word seemed to excite prodigiously. At full speed. Don't you see? At full speed. I know, I see. Repeated Passepartout. But it would be, if not more prudent, since that word displeases you, at least more natural. Who? What? What's the matter with this fellow? Cried several. The poor fellow did not know to whom to address himself. Are you afraid? Asked Colonel Proctor. I afraid? Very well. I will show these people that a Frenchman can be as American as they. All aboard. Cried the conductor. Yes, all aboard. Repeated Passepartout, and immediately. But they can't prevent me from thinking that it would be more natural for us to cross the bridge on foot, and let the train come after. But no one heard this sage reflection, nor would anyone have acknowledged its justice. The passengers resumed their places in the cars. Passepartout took his seat without telling what had passed. The whist players were quite absorbed in their game. The locomotive whistled vigorously. The engineer, reversing the steam, backed the train for nearly a mile, retiring, like a jumper, in order to take a longer leap. Then, with another whistle, he began to move forward. The train increased its speed, and soon its rapidity became frightful. A prolonged screech issued from the locomotive. The piston worked up and down twenty strokes to the second. They perceived that the whole train, rushing on at the rate of a hundred miles an hour, hardly bore upon the rails at all. And they passed over. It was like a flash. No one saw the bridge. The train leapt, so to speak, from one bank to the other, and the engineer could not stop it until it had gone five miles beyond the station. But scarcely had the train passed the river, when the bridge, completely ruined, fell with a crash into the rapids of Medicine Bow. End of chapter 28 Wow! At least 50% chance of success, and maybe even 80%. Who wouldn't take those chances? Do you think Verne saw Americans as a little bit reckless? And Passepartout did ask a very good question. Why didn't Philia's fog wait until summer or spring and better weather conditions to try this trip? Is he really running from something after all? If you'd like to hear how the story continues, tune in next time.